Well, it's been a good service already. I'll tell you that a baby dedication, really, really good. And now I'd like us to turn to John chapter 15. Maybe you guessed that. We'll read a few more verses in this chapter tonight and kind of complete the thoughts that we had this morning from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is going to be good. Well, I'll tell you one thing you did that was smart today. You decided to come to church tonight at First Baptist Church. Now, I'm seeing a few people that I don't really know. That doesn't mean that you're not at other times at our church. But I'm making assumptions like that. But you're smart, I know that, because you came to First Baptist on Sunday night. Now, I want to tell you something else that's smart about that. I don't know if you've uh, figured this out yet, but you know what you're going to find here? Love. There's love all over this church. And there's straight talk from the Bible, no matter who the preacher is. Now, I'm sitting down for a reason. I had uh, COVID, and uh, now I'm over it. And uh, But during the COVID, I took a fall <clears throat> and hit my head and had a concussion. And uh, you might say, what's wrong with that crippled guy up there? Okay, I'll tell you what's wrong. I'm wobbly. I can walk, but that's what I call it. I lose my balance. And last week, I got to preach at North Love Baptist Church in Rockford. How many of you have ever been in Rockford, Illinois? Ever been there? Raise your hand. Okay, they're very friendly people. And they're the ones who figured out this way of sitting Flanders uh, down so he doesn't break his neck, okay? So they're the ones who did that and it went off very successfully. But you know what? I got all worked up in a sermon. Have you ever seen preachers do that? And I made a point and I stood up in the sermon, I think I terrified two or three of the assistant pastors, but it turned out fine. And uh, you know what? I, I want to get back around to all of you, including you visitors tonight. I am glad that you came this evening because I'd like you to see me when I'm normal. Now, some of you are thinking that would be a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Flanders isn't very normal. I wrote a book. It's called Back to Normal. I've had people say, what right do you have? to write a book called Back to Normal. But anyway, I will be set again. And uh, my physical therapist in Vassar, who's from Turkey, incidentally, uh, I said, now, where are you from? I can tell from your accent, you're not from America. He said, well, I'm from Turkey. I said, did you know that's the Holy Land? How many of you knew that Turkey was the Holy Land? He did. You know why? That's where the Apostle Paul did a lot of his ministry. And the seven churches of the apocalypse are all in Turkey. And this guy is from one of those towns, Smyrna. He grew up in Smyrna. I've had a, a good witnessing opportunity uh, there. It's been quite interesting. But he told me, now what you're really having a problem with, we're working against it with physical therapy and uh, trying to get me to keep my balance better. And uh, that's good. But he says, I think it's really from COVID. That's apparently one of the symptoms you get is a little bit of wobbliness. And he says, one day it's just going to disappear. Man, oh man, you know what you can do? Pray for me that that day will come real soon so that I cannot be nervous about walking around. Okay, great to see you this evening. We're going to have a good service. It's going to be the right one. The one, the verses in the Bible God chose for us. John chapter 15. Now run down, please, to verse 9. These are words spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. Follow him. These are sentences. They are thoughts. And you know what? Jesus Christ talked to his disciples the night before he died. John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. But man, this is a significant several verses. So follow it and uh, uh, see what he says. Verse 9. As the Father hath loved me. Now let me ask you a question. How long has the Father loved the Son of God? Eternity. And you know, love would be the emotional attachment between the persons of the Trinity. It goes all the way back through eternity. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide or continue in my love, even as I have kept my commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, 
that my joy might remain in you. Wow. And that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now you stop and think a little bit. Uh, in what scenario do men lay down their lives for their friends? The only one I know of is the battlefield. Who would have dreamed that Jesus Christ took as an example of love something that happens on the battlefield? You know, we give uh, rewards, we give medals to people who heroically act on the battlefield to rescue other people. And we may not realize, some of you who have been in combat, combat know this is true, that men who uh, risk their life in a battle, they do it for their country, they do it for freedom, they do it for their wife and children, but they mainly at that time do it for their buddies. <laughs> Here's a situation, we're all gonna be killed. But if one guy could run out there and throw a hand grenade over there in that uh, machine gun nest, we might all, all of us except for the one man, <laughs> survive. That's what he does. They do it for their buddies, their friends. Now, they didn't know that he was going to die for his friends tomorrow. When I finished pastoring at Junietta Baptist Church, somewhere in there I got to talk a little bit. And, you know, I got up and I said, I want to talk a few minutes about my best friend. <laughs> Matter of fact, he was my friend before I, I even knew him. And he went to Calvary to get me so many wonderful things. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Then he said, ye are my friends. If ye do whatsoever, I command you. Now follow this. Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. I'm going to read a few couple different verses also in this chapter. But I want you to remember this morning, you know, one of the most dangerous things for a preacher to do is to ask a question to find out if people remember what he preached. And I'm going to tell you, it can be devastating. And I'm a very sensitive person. So I'd like you to keep your mouth shut if you don't remember. Okay? But basically, we do remember. And you know what? I'm going to read the verse from this morning in the context, two verses ahead of time, okay? And I'm gonna ask you to, in a minute, I'm not gonna complicate this, to actually repeat verse seven. But we'll start with verse five, it says this, I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth in his, as a branch and is uh, withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Wow. Okay, now would you say verse 7 with me? And you can cheat by having your Bible open. Okay, you don't have to say it by heart. Verse 7 says this. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And we thought about Psalm 119, when we thought about his words abiding in us, and the effect it can have on our lives. And uh, that was a very important thing. And in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus Christ taught them how to live the abundant life. Not just to be saved. Now, I'm glad I'm saved, aren't you? Amen. But something 
higher, a powerful life. And part of it is answers to prayer. Now, I want to tell you something. I'm not in a big hurry tonight. I'm really not in a big hurry. And you know what? In my crippled condition, <laughs> I would hang out here for a long time to talk to you individually if you want to talk or if you want to pray together. We read a verse this morning that says that uh, ye shall ask anything and it shall be done unto you. Did you know that's true? And if you, I think somebody here has something on your heart, a very serious problem that Brother Flanders would be glad to pray with you about. And I'm going to tell you, Christian people ought to expect to get their prayers answered. <laughs> you know, preachers actually do all the harm. We'll say, you know, Jesus answers every prayer. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says wait. Now there's truth in that, but you can't find a verse to say that. Answers to prayer in the Bible was when you asked for something and that exact thing happened. And I'm telling you, he does that. Do you remember that place in 1 Peter where it tells the husband to dwell with the wives according to knowledge? Giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. That language sounds like early Christians expected their prayers to be answered. And you know what? If what I asked for doesn't come, it must have been hindered. There's a reason. Because that's not normal. Normal is a child of God asking and getting what they ask for. This very night, Jesus Christ said, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. Yeah, why should we pray? Because it helps us feel better. Now, I'm going to tell you, I feel better when I pray. Yeah, but that's not what it's for. <laughs> Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Two things. Number one, the reason we pray is to get stuff done. And that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If I say, you know why that happened? Last night, I asked the Father in the name of his Son to do it. And he did. It ought to be the regular experience of Christians. We'd be glad to pray with you tonight. But here's my question for you, because you look like you're still awake, okay? Ah, uh, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. My question is this. If you were to do what we talked about tonight, if you were to have the word of God abiding in you by studying it, Asking God to teach it to you, meditating on it, the different things that we talked about that I hope you'll do. Okay, if a person does all those things to have the word of God abiding in them, does that mean automatically that they'll have great answers to prayer? George Mueller. If we read our Bible every day, more chapters than we did last year. If we memorize scriptures, Meditate on them. If we ask God to open our eyes so we understand, if we do those things, if his words abide in us, does that automatically mean we're going to start getting our prayers answered? Okay, I was hoping you wouldn't answer me. Because that's the sermon. The answer is yes. For certain people, not everybody, who engages in connection with the word of God regularly is going to have that phenomenal a change. But certain people will. You have your Bible open. Who? Who is it that can expect remarkable answers to prayer regularly, specific answers to prayer? I asked for this and it happened in the afternoon when I prayed in the morning. Well, it's not just anybody who memorizes and meditates on the Word of God. It's who? Hmm? People who abide in Jesus. People who abide in Jesus. And may I tell you, that is a remarkable level of spirituality, but it's doable for you. 
There have been many teenagers that have had remarkable answers to prayer. I've been places where their parents got saved. I can think of a girl where the pastor called a prayer meeting in the daytime. We prayed together and then they all prayed for her parents who lived about three blocks away. And you know what? A couple of days later, we were able to lead them to Jesus Christ. And, they came. and I think it had to do with that teenage girl's prayers. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? You can be a person who regularly sees miracles. You could have a miracle life. But it starts with, if ye abide in me. If ye abide in me. If you come to that level of Christianity. And my words abide in you. If you get into the word of God the way we talked about it today. And let it affect you. Ye shall ask what you will. And it shall be done unto you. Now I'd like you to get familiar with the term abide in me. Oh Lord, teach us what it is to abide in you. And Lord, make it easy enough that we'll try it. And I'm praying for Christian people tonight who need to come to that higher level, the abundant life, by abiding in you. But I'm praying also for people who do not know Jesus Christ. They know his name. They come to his church. But they've never come to Jesus. I pray for them to understand, abide in me, and to come not only to eternal life, but to an abundant life. That's my prayer, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, are you familiar with the book of John? Okay. I'm going to tell you something. The book of John has a purpose. The purpose is to introduce the reader to Jesus Christ. How do you know that? Chapter 20 says, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Throughout the book of John, which tells stories about Jesus Christ, for the purpose of convincing you that he is who he claimed to be. Who did he claim to be? I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. A while we verse, man, oh man. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. <laughs> I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Wow. All the way through the book of John, I am, I am. And then here it says, I am the true vine. Wow. Now, he is who he claimed to be. And summing it up, He's the Son of God and God the Son. And you can find out that to be true by reading the book of John, which is how I became a Christian. Somebody said that to me, and so I read the book of John with a little bit of help. And it introduced me to Jesus Christ. Now, uh, why did Jesus come to earth according to the book of John? In John 10.10, 10, he says, I am come that they might have life. And have it more abundantly. <laughs> he came to give men life. Now you may be breathing. And your eyes may be open. But the fact is. We sinners are all dead. Dead in our sins. But the son of God right from chapter 1. Came to give us his life. He didn't just give his life for us. He gave his life to us. Well, And you run into the book of John. How to have the eternal life Jesus came to give. Chapter 1 says, receive him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. God in the book of John uses several terms about saving faith. Do you know how you'll be saved? Faith. Putting your trust in Jesus. Not joining the right church. Not doing more good than bad. The way you'll get to heaven is by faith in Jesus Christ, which is to receive him. Chapters 2 and 3, believe in his name. The word believe in the Bible is the verb form of the word faith. It doesn't just mean in your mind accepting the fact that there's a God. No, to believe in Jesus means to put your faith in Jesus. That's the meaning. And we find that especially in chapters 2 and 3. Chapter 4 says that saving faith is to ask. 
He said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water, told that woman at that well in Samaria. You just ask. It's not just saying the words of a prayer. It's putting your faith in Christ and expressing that faith in a prayer. And many of us in this room, the moment you trusted him for your salvation was a moment in which you were praying. Ask. Chapters 5 and 6 use the word come. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. A term for saving faith is come. It simply means this. If you know you need salvation, come to me and I'll give it to you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Son of God said, I died for your sins and rose again the third day. And if you just come to me, I'll take care of it with the Father. Is that too simple? No, that's exactly saving faith. Come. I remember talking to an old lady in a nursing home. And I'm going to tell you, I have trouble nowadays finding old women. Because I don't know who to call old. But she was old. I was in charge of a bus ministry. And uh, we were picking up people from the nursing home. So I went out to see her. And she was a very nice lady. And I read scripture with her. And I said, uh, let me ask you something, Grandma. I just called her Grandma. I said, Grandma, <clears throat> the time is coming when we're all going to die. And we're both getting closer to that time. Let me ask you something. When you die, are you going to go to heaven? She said, I don't know. And I don't think I will. So I showed her verses in the Bible that many of you could have shown her about God's love, about Christ dying for us. And about his offer to save anybody who would put their faith in him. She said, I see that. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I read that verse. If you call upon the name of the Lord, Grandma, will he save you? Yes, he will. Well, would you like to do that? She said, yes, I will. Yes, I would. So we bowed our heads and she prayed like a little child and said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying for me. I'd like to ask you to save me. So then afterwards... Like a trained soul winner, I read the verse, whosoever, that's anyone, shall call upon the name of the Lord, tells you what to do, shall be saved. Grandma, a few minutes ago, did you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and ask him to save you? Yes, I did. Well, according to that verse in the Bible, are you saved? She said, I don't know. <laughs> well, I decided to come up with another verse. And then I said, now that you have called on Jesus and put your faith in him, are you saved? And she said, I don't know. So I went to John chapter 6 where it says, come. Uh, I'm the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth in me shall never thirst. And I said, a few minutes ago, the best way you knew how, did you come to Jesus and want to be saved? She said, yes, I do. Did. A couple verses later, you know what it says? Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. <laughs> I said, Grandma, when you came to Jesus wanting to be saved, did he kick you out? Did he tell you no? Or did he take you in? She smiled and said, he took me in. Amen. Amen. So God is leading us to himself through Jesus Christ. In chapters 5 and 6, he's saying, come. And then after chapter 6, the Apostle John, inspired by the Spirit, is showing people who have believed how to live the abundant life. It's not just I'm going to go to heaven when I die. If that's all that Christianity was, I tell you, it would be a pretty sad situation. Uh, here we come in on Sunday morning. We see Brother Howell. He says, how are you today? And you say, well, I'm certainly better because I am another week closer to my funeral. I'm a Christian. When I die, I'm going to heaven. And if that was the only thing you got through salvation, it would be a sad situation. <laughs> Counting the days when you'll draw your last breath. But that's not what it is. I am come that they might have life, my life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Wow. And from chapter 7 on, he explains about the abundant life and experiencing it. 7, 8, 9, 10. 
Finally, we get to those chapters I mentioned this morning, chapters 13 through 17, and the climax is in chapter 15. Abide in me. If you want to be saved, come to me. If you want to live the abundant life, a life of miracles, victory, productivity, abide in me. That's what he told them. Now we need to learn what that means, and I'm not going to preach a complicated sermon. There was the climax of that part about the abundant life. Wow. And here's how chapters 15 through 17 go. Okay, you said you weren't going to take very long. I'm really not. Chapter 13, he told them what their roles would be in the world. Do you know what you're doing here? Why you are still connected by gravity to planet Earth? You have roles to play. Chapter 14 is about the resources he was going to give us to fulfill our roles. Supernatural resources. Chapter 15 is abide in me. How to make that work. Resources. Answers to prayer in Jesus' name. The Holy Ghost. Because we're Baptists, a lot of us don't know anything about the Holy Ghost. That's why we're so dead. So, all those wonderful things he teaches about living on a higher level. Especially chapters 14, 15, and 16. And the level is abide in me, which is the same thing as filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't want to lose you here. But we were sealed with the Spirit when we got saved. God's Spirit came to live inside. But you're filled with the Spirit when you have absolutely surrendered to God. And filled with the Spirit is better than sealed with the Spirit. (laughs) And it affects you every day of your life. Wow. A higher level of living. Also called walk in the Spirit. I've got an evangelist friend by the name of Jim Van Gelderen. I think he's been here too. Jim Van Gelderen, a couple years ago at a big youth conclave somewhere, started a movement called the The Generation, T-H-E-E, instead of the B Generation, the The Generation. And you can join it if you're young enough. It's for teenagers. And you know what they want you to do? They want you to fill out a card where you say, I have dedicated my life to Jesus Christ on this level. I am giving him absolute dedication. I'll do whatever. I'll do whatever. Sign the card. I'm giving Jesus Christ absolute dedication. And also I'm going to give him absolute dependence. Because I am seeking to live a life that's far above me. A life of hope, holiness, and a life of love. And the only way I can do that is by God's Spirit granting me that ability. Without me, you can do nothing. Absolutely, absolute dedication, absolute dependence. And I'm going to tell you something. When I heard about it, I wasn't at that big youth meeting. I said, that's abide in me. That's the definition of abide in me. If I can get up in the morning and say, Lord Jesus, is there anything you want done? I'll do whatever. I'm your friend. I'll do whatever, absolutely whatever. Anything you want done? But Lord, you know me. I'm weak. And if things go like they usually do, I'll fail. So I'm going to need help. That's the abiding me life. All day long, I'm just doing what he wants me to do. I mentioned that this morning. If you love me, keep my commandments. Did you know that's what I do? I'm not trying to act like some very special person. But did you know that's all I do? I love him, so all I do is keep his commandments. You might say, don't you take care of your wife? Don't you wish her happy birthday on her birthday? Aren't there other things you do? Yeah, that's keeping his commandments. He's the one who told me to love my wife. Don't you pay your bills? That's right, I'm doing what he commanded. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's not just an important part of my life. That is my life. That is my life. And that's the abide in me life. The greatest life of all. A life of peace. A life of love. A life of joy. And a life of productivity and victory. Wow. It's amazing. 
See, and the abide in me life is a decision and a life. It's not just a decision that makes you feel better, but you ought to make the decision. Lord, I'm not going to live on a low level. I'm not just going to have your spirit without your spirit having me. I'm dedicating myself to you without reservation, but I'm going to need your daily help, supernatural help. It is a decision, but it's a life. You know, I travel for the cause of revival. What is revival? It is more a life than anything. It can be an event in a church or a youth group or something like that. But I'm going to tell you something, friends. Revival could be a process, but fundamentally it's a life. And if this whole church was in revival in the dark city of Saginaw, it would be called because individual men and women and kids are living the revived life, which is abide in me. I still don't get it. Well, I'll tell you something. You ought to get it. And I'll tell you, if I were you, I would give myself an assignment to study my Bible until I understood abide in me. And there's several things I've talked about already having to do with the abide in me life. And I'm basically going to tell you one more thing. It's a life of love. He had told them, abide in me. You will bear much fruit. You'll be a fisher of men. You'll have a fantastic life of victory and peace. And then he says, let me explain this to you. And then he said the verses we just read. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. And then he ends up saying, love one another. You know what this life is? A life of love. 1904, I doubt if you remember it. January. It was a church on the west side of the Principality of Wales. There was a new interest in real Christianity in Wales. In revival, and the great Welsh revival was beginning. But they say it began at a youth meeting. <laughs> many of the young people had got their hearts right with God and many had been saved. And now they had a youth meeting early in the morning before church and Sunday school. And the youth were together and whoever was in charge of it decided to give them a chance for testimonies, which would be a pretty tough thing to do for adults or teenagers. Let's give testimonies. And if you want to say anything for Jesus Christ, sometimes that's like pulling teeth. And nobody said a word. They were all nervously silent until a girl, we have her name, I don't remember it, till a teenage girl who'd only been saved a month ago said, well, I don't know if anybody else is going to say anything, but I'd just like to say that I love Jesus Christ with all my heart. And many historians say that was the beginning of the Welsh revival that swept a quarter of a million people in to the kingdom of God in just two years. I love the Lord Jesus with all of my heart. And I'm going to tell you, friends, that is the Christian life. I had a friend in high school. Yes, I went to high school, graduated and everything. I went to R.J. Reynolds High School, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Yes, that's where they make the cigarettes. I know that. And R.J. Reynolds, that was the guy who owned the cigarette or the tobacco company. Uh, but anyway, I went to R.J. Reynolds High School, graduated in 1965. That's not 1865, but 1965. And one of the guys who went to school with me was Charlie Brown. That's no kidding. When I was a senior, he was a junior. And a friend of mine named Wayne Kinney, who was not a Christian, I have found that he got saved before he died, that many years later he got cancer, that during his illness he received Christ. His sister, who is now a Christian, uh, was able to tell my sister and I, Wayne got saved. But he wasn't saved at this time. We were in high school, and he was over my house, and he just said this, hey, you know Charlie Brown? I said, yeah. And he was very popular. He was uh, a great under us, but he was vice president of the junior class, and yet he was a good Christian, and that's unusual. Sometimes they reject you if you're a good Christian, and then my friend Wayne, he said, you know Charlie Brown. I said, yeah, I know Charlie Brown. He said, he's a fanatic, and I was taken back because I wasn't much of a Christian. I didn't testify or confess Christ, 
And here was Wayne, my old buddy. I'd never talked to him about Jesus. Wayne says, Charlie Brown is a fanatic. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I'll tell you a couple of things. <clears throat> he was at baccalaureate. That was religious service, even in the public school. When they were speaking about Easter, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I looked down the row at our auditorium, and Charlie Brown was crying, wiping his eyes. Charlie Brown's a fanatic. And not only that, Rick, at the football game, and our school was a football school, not basketball, not baseball, but I tell you what, they played football, and we usually won. And you know what he was doing? After the football game, he was going down to the hamburger joint where we all were. He was giving out religious literature, telling people they needed to be saved. Charlie Brown's a fanatic. I want to tell you, I have reconnected with Charlie Brown. I was down in Mount Airy, North Carolina for revival meetings like last year. Mount Airy, incidentally, is Mayberry. Yeah, that's where Andy Griffith was from. But anyway, before I went down there, I was back in touch with Charlie Brown, who had reconnected with me. We met. We had something to eat. He came up to the revival meetings. He's still on fire for God. Yeah. Charlie Brown. Wayne Kinney. And I ended up saying to Wayne, embarrassed, because I'm a Christian too and I never talked to him about the Lord. I said, Wayne, you know what's wrong with Charlie Brown? He just loves Jesus a whole lot more than you and me. That's what was going on with Charlie Brown. He loved Jesus. That's what the Christian life is. You know, he said, abide in me. There's a lot could be taught about by abide in me. But in a way, that's saying, live my life. Don't live your life. Don't live your life dedicated to me. Live my life. Abide in me. Wow. It's the abundant life. An amazing thing. And you know what? If we can live his life not by trying to, that's what some people preach, and that is, I need to work hard at living like Jesus. But I'm going to tell you what, that's a vain attempt. You're going to fall really short. But if you do what he said, love him, keep his commandments, and trust him for the power, you'll have the abide in me life, which is a miracle life. And you know what you'll be doing? Living his life. Speaking his words. Doing his works. Fulfilling his father's will. And bearing his fruit. You know, I'm going to tell you, how come you just batter those out? I pray that regularly. Dear Lord, today, I don't want to live my life. I want to live your life. Today, may I speak your words and not my words. May I do your works. May I fulfill your Father's will. And may I witness and bear your fruit. Wow. From the inside. And can I tell you something? It is definitely doable. Because the one we're talking about lives inside us. Yes, he does. Now, these things I want to point out, then I'll quit. I was going to say, then I'll sit down, but I'm already sitting down. <laughs> Number one, it's all about love. This kind of love comes down from above. Look back at verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Then he says, if you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. And then it ends up saying that ye love one another, verse 12. Okay, here's how this goes. The love began with the Father. I think this morning I said, how long has the Father loved his Son? And of course, it's forever. And love is the emotional attachment between the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he's always loved his Son. But here's how he explained it. My Father loved me. So I loved him back. And my love for him, now don't take me wrong about this, made me willing to do whatever he says. One of the things the Father told me was to love you. 
if you will love me back like I love my father back and keep my commandments, then you'll abide in my love. One of my commandments is, is that you love one another. You know what? This is moving. We're going to keep going. <laughs> I love you. Love me. Be willing to do whatever I say. One of the things I want you to do is love one another. When you're loved, the response to love is willingness. So somebody at First Baptist loves me. You know what I ought to do? I ought to love you back and be willing to do you good. First John deals with this. It's called perfect love. Some of you have studied your Bible enough to know that the word perfect doesn't mean absolutely sinless. It means complete. See, and that progression of father, son, me, and others is perfect love, or it's called in 1 John, love perfected. And the bottom line is that we're loving one another, but the love didn't come from our hearts. It came from his heart all the way down. Wow, that's amazing. And it's a miraculous life. It's the highest level of love. It's the highest level of Christianity. Number two, love, this love, prompts willingness. That's what we just read. It prompts willingness. Willingness, verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. See, him loving me ought to make me willing to do whatever he says. Because it's love. Answer me this question. Why would I be motivated to love him? Is he a religious figure? A historical character? Why would I love Jesus Christ? The Bible says we love him because, come on, you can talk. We love him because he first loved us. That's in 1 John. And you know what? We ought to start with the talking. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me and dying for me. And then start lifting off, uh, listing off the benefits that have come from the fact that he loves us. You forgave me and you keep on forgiving me. You guide me. You protect me. You're my best friend. That'd be a good thing to say tonight before you go to bed. Lord Jesus, I love you because you're my best friend. You're my best friend. And the love came from the Father to the Son, to us, and to others. And the whole Christian life is about love. That's why it's so dangerous to let your love go cold. Because the whole thing comes from love. Number three, it changes us radically. See, uh, tonight, we ought to say, I love you, Jesus. I may not love you like I should, but I do love you because you love me. Who would be able to say, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, who would be able to say with me sitting here and you sitting there, I believe I'd be honest if I said I love Jesus Christ. Raise your hand. Okay. We ought to talk to him about it. I think that's a very good thing to do. To periodically actually tell him we love him. And then you know, because I love you, I'm willing to do anything. Not just go to a foreign country. Not just die for the Christian faith. No, I'm willing to do anything you want me to do. It might be to apologize to somebody before I leave church. I do love you. And Lord, because I love you, I will. Or I won't. Because it's all about love. Tonight. Came from the Father to the Son. Came to me and then to you. So pass the love down. Pass the love down by letting his love love somebody else right in this room. Some of you have issues tonight that this sermon applies to. 
You know, shall I forgive her again? Love. What would a person who loved her do about this issue? Hmm? Shall I try to witness to him? Love. It's about love. Not fundamentally my love for my neighbor, but my love for Jesus Christ. Bill Rice, the founder of the Bill Rice Ranch, used to tell the story of being in a service where there was a young girl who was going to go to China as a missionary. Years ago, many people went to China. She was going to China as a missionary. She was giving her testimony in the service. And he overheard someone say to her, you must love the Chinese people. You've never left your home country. Now you're going to spend your whole life over there risking your life to spread the gospel. You must really love Chinese people. She said, I have no idea if I love Chinese people. <laughs> I've never lived there. I don't know if I love them, but I know that I love Jesus Christ. And that's why I'm going to China. It's all about love. And you know what we need to do? Revive our love for Jesus Christ by passing the love down. See, he loved me. I'm going to love him by telling him so and by going to the next step, which is do the deeds that love would bring about. I'll do whatever. Pass the love down by loving somebody else, letting Jesus love through you and let it go down. That progression of love. And by doing that, let the love flow. How many of you think that the love of God is needed in Saginaw? See, there ought to be a preacher who uh, will let the love of God come down into this town. No, what? There ought to be a teenage girl that would do that. The source is the same. It's the father and the son. And you know what? The love moves down as I respond to his love by being willing. I'm willing. Not because I'm scared. You know what? Preachers are interesting. Some preachers make you think that the reason you need to be in church every Sunday, the reason you need to give the tithe that's 10% of your gross income, the reason you ought not to run around with the wrong people is that someday God might kill you. A loving Heavenly Father will chastise you by letting you run over your little girl, by letting your house burn down. I've heard a lot of preaching like that. But I'm going to tell you something, friends. Christianity is not about being scared to death. It's about loving. Loving him. Because he first loved us. First John is all about this, too. You can go back and read it. But uh, do you remember the part, part where it says, Herein is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not his commandments are not grievous. Now, why it is, why is it that some Christians just go ahead and get baptized? Just go ahead and start tithing. Just go ahead and apologize to the person. Why do they do that? And it doesn't seem to bother them. And it's so hard for me. You don't love him very much. If we love him, we're willing to keep his commandments. And it isn't even grievous. We're not regretting it or feeling bad about the whole thing. It's easy. Do you know why it's easy to obey the commandments of Christ? Because it's love. It's love. It's easy because it's love. It's hard because we don't love him very much. But we can. The love of God was shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. If you're saved, you've got the love of God in you. But you mean that need, need, I need to fan the flame. What I do, I might not even wait till the end of the summer. Sermon, who knows when that will be. But I'd find a place to get on my knees. That's the appropriate posture. And tell Jesus Christ that I love him. See, I told him that I love him. Well, you know what? Maybe he wonders about you. Maybe it's been a long time. Get down on your knees and said, if nobody on planet Earth ever loved you, I love you. And I'll do anything. That's what ought to happen today before we go home. 
rekindle our love. See, we love him because he first loved us. Who denies that the Son of God loved us? And friends, Jesus is the Savior. He saves sinners. Are you a sinner? He doesn't hate sinners. He loves us. He died to keep you out of hell. And you know what? Out of love for him, you ought to come to him and let him save your soul. He said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. And he called you his friend when you don't have a thing to do with him. I know what you ought to do tonight. You ought to come to Jesus Christ and let him do what he came to earth to do for everybody. Let him save your soul. If you say, I'm not even sure what that means. He knows what it means. Ask him to save your soul and do it if for no other reason, out of love for him. And every Christian ought to have a revival by reviving your love. Doesn't that make sense? And the kind of people who live in Saginaw who absolutely love Jesus Christ, and they don't mind who knows it, and they serve him, and they face ridicule and so on, and they're always in church, even Sunday night when a crippled man preaches it. <laughs> the on-fire kinds of people, they're the ones that if they spend enough time in the Bible are going to know what he wants, and they're going to be used of God in a miraculous way, according to John 15, 7. That's going to happen to you, and it'll start tonight if we will renew our love. Dear Lord, thank you for the power of your love. Now, Lord, let us yield. Let us be willing. Let us think of everything we read in the Bible as being for our good because you love us. May we yield to you. May the areas where we especially need to yield become clear in our mind last tonight so that we can act on them. Lord Jesus, we do love you. And Lord, we're willing to do whatever you want. I'd like us to stand up with our heads bowed. Okay, with our heads bowed, standing up, even if you're a visitor tonight. If you're a person who needs to have that kind of conversation with Jesus Christ, would you join the others who have walked to the front? This is not a ritual. These people are serious. And you know what? If you feel like you need to tell Jesus Christ you love him, and are willing to do whatever he shows you to do. I think you ought to do it before you go home. I think you ought to do it right here. I think it would be good to tell somebody tonight what God did in your heart. And let the revival spread. Let the love flow. And then act on your love. By loving somebody, he has shown you love. While they're praying, I'd like to ask a question. Who is standing and will say, Brother Flanders, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I've committed many sins. But because of what Jesus did for me and the promises of the Bible, I know for a fact that I'm going to go to heaven and not hell. If that would be you, friend, just raise up your hand. Let me see your hand. I'm not going to point you out or embarrass you. Thank you very much. Who would say, Brother Flanders, I couldn't say that I know for a fact that I'm going to heaven because maybe I don't know enough Bible to know that for a fact. And I don't know that I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. But I'm willing to say, I would like to be saved. I maybe don't know that I am saved. But I know I'd like to be saved. And I'll let you pray for me. Now, I'm not going to name you or point you out, but I'll pray for you if you'll let me and you're letting me pray for you by raising your hand right now hold up your hand even a little bit i'll acknowledge that i saw somebody's hand then i'll pray for you it's all about love folks it's not hard to get saved jesus did the hard part and made it easy for you and for me thank you lord jesus for loving us Thank you for loving your Father and being obedient even unto death, even the death of the cross. Thank you, Lord, for being in this room. Now, Lord, let your love flow. May there be a revival at First Baptist Church that is born of God's love. 
Let really good things happen, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.